Okay, so um, now that you know about gravity, you know about circular motion, things tend to like all start coming together when we start talking about the orbits that either satellites make or rockets will make or planets will make or moons will make. Like they, they ask all different things, but all of these time things, we're just talking about orbits, things we're moving in ideal circular paths around planets. And for the most part, we'll assume that they are moving in circles. Um, so if we're doing these kind of things, there's some important facts and formulas that you should be aware of that have come up in the past. We're going to kind of pull them all together for this orbit, uh, this orbit issue. Uh, so first one is Newton's second law. The acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces over the mass. Then we have what kind of force is mostly going to be involved in these problems, the force of gravity. So that's g times the mass of the first object, mass of the second object, over the distance between their centers of mass. Uh, since we are moving in circles, we're going to have centripetal acceleration, v squared over r. And then things get a little bit more like out there. We can say, well, the path that it's taking is 2 pi r. Uh, so that's how far the orbital distance is. Uh, and then our last one is just if we're trying to figure out tangential velocity, then we can talk about how far is it traveling and in how much time to figure out what its uh, approximate velocity would be. So with all of that stuff together, we can start doing some things with orbits. I'm not actually gonna answer a question here. Uh, oh, and then there's in orbit, the only force is gravitational force. And you'll see that the mass of the orbiting object just doesn't matter. So I'm gonna go through here and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna derive some general orbital formulas and show you guys how you kind of mix and match all these formulas together to make that happen. I'll do an example problem in the next video and we'll do some of them, in, uh, several of them in class and as independent work. Um, but um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how you kind of like fit formulas together. And this is a hard skill. It's one that students don't usually come into the class feeling really, really comfortable with, um, but it's one that I hope that you'll take with you as you leave this class of being just comfortable saying like, I, I have all these tools, what can I do with them? Uh, and that's basically how I do, uh, do physics or did physics originally, uh, is I knew the formulas existed. And even though I wasn't sure where I was going, I knew I could just like plug one part of a formula into another part. And I just kept doing that until I got to an answer. And surprisingly, it works a lot of the time. Uh, so uh, let's talk about this object. I have this object in an orbit which means if I was drawing a free body diagram for it, uh, it has the force of gravity pulling it towards the center. Uh, and that's where this only force in orbit is gravitational force. That means then that I can start with this formula here, uh, the sum of the forces uh, over m. Uh, and I'm going to just call this one right now. I'm going to call that m2. I'm going to label them, uh, or, or I guess I already did. Uh, and this is mass 2. Remember that because that's the object that we talked about the force acting on. So it has to be M2 right there. Uh, then I can go down to my next step and say, okay, well, what force is acting on it? It's the force of gravity. And since it's the force of gravity, I can pull in this next equation, G M1 M2 all over R squared. And that's gonna let me cancel out my M2s because I have an M2 in the numerator, M2 in the denominator. That's this part right here, the mass of the orbiting object. That's what color I should be using, dang it. Boy, that would have been really cool. I just did that on my first try. That's why I'm allowed to cancel that. Super. Uh, so then uh, our formula is now uh, the acceleration is equal to uh, what's left from the uh, this formula over r squared. But what kind of acceleration do we have? Well, it's moving in a circular orbit, which means it's centripetal acceleration. So I can plug in now uh, the v squared over r in place of the a, uh, and uh, this stuff's still over here, but notice now I have an R on the bottom of this one and an R squared on the bottom of that one. Uh, so I don't really have a good color reason to cancel out, but I used this red earlier, so I'll use it again. Uh, that gets rid of one R on the bottom and it uh, gets rid of all the R's on the bottom of that one. Uh, so coming up to here, my equation now looks like this. Uh, you can see that it's kind of getting... Uh, a little bit more uh, more simple as we get further into this. Uh, and by the way, I'm just I'm taking this problem as far as it could possibly go. A lot of the times you might have stopped quite a while ago um, in in this derivation. You you may already have answered your question, but I'm taking it all the way to the end. Uh, so from here uh, we can we have a, a formula that describes 
the orbital velocity in terms of the mass of the object you're going around and how far you are away from it. And it's important to notice that as you move further away, since this number is on the, the R is on the denominator, uh, as you move further away, the velocity actually decreases, which is not what people tend to assume. If the star itself uh, or whatever you're orbiting is bigger, then the velocity has to be bigger in order to keep you in orbit. Uh, so uh, you can see that there's some relationships that happen there. Uh, but if the question is not asked about orbital velocity, often it asks something about either the orbital period or the orbital, just the orbital distance uh, in relation to some other variable. So I'm going to go another step and say, OK, well, let's talk about the change in position. That's where this is coming in. The change in position over time squared, because I have to keep it. Oh, I'll do that squared part in yellow, because that's coming from the previous part of the formula. Uh, and that equals gm1 over r. Um, but the, the distance that you're traveling is actually 2 pi r, because you're traveling in a circle. Uh, so I can do 2 pi r over the t from the previous step with the squared from the previous step equals this from the previous several previous steps. And if I if I square that out, uh, then we get to something that looks like uh, I'm going to put the two pi still in uh, parentheses because I don't really see a good reason to not have that anymore. Uh, and then the r is squared all over the t, which is also squared. My square should be yellow. Sorry, guys. Uh, and that equals gm1 over r. So it's getting pretty ugly. Uh, I'm going to take it up and I'm going to point out that, look, I have an r squared there. So I'm actually just going to multiply both sides by r so I can get rid of this r in the bottom and put it up there. Uh, and that gets us to probably where I should stop if I was a reasonable teacher. Uh, if I was a reasonable human being, I would have stopped already. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep going because, um, you know, why not? Uh, this we're actually not done with the kind of problems they might ask you. So uh, let's just keep taking this as far as we can possibly get it. Uh, and that all equals gm1. So from here, what they usually do in problems is they start asking, if we change this variable, how would it change that variable? Uh, and if you're doing that kind of thing, what you need to do is to solve for the one that you care about and get it by itself. So for example, if somebody said, we're changing this, how does it change the orbital period? You would want to rearrange it so that the formula then looks like this. And I'm not going to do billions of colors anymore because I'm just done with that. Uh, you just say the orbital period is based off of 2 pi squared times r cubed all over g times the mass of the star. And this is actually one of Kepler's laws. If you took uh, physics of the universe, you may actually recognize the t squared and the r cubed part. Uh, if instead, though, somebody was asking me a question about the radius, how you would change the radius based off the orbital period, uh, then the formula would look something more like this, uh, gm1 over t squared all over uh, 2 pi uh, squared. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and then uh, probably the last thing is if somebody was asking, okay, well, we know the distance and we know the uh, orbital period, how would we figure out the mass of the uh, star? Uh, and then this is the easiest uh, rearrangement to make, 2 pi, uh, or I should solve it for M on the left. Uh, so M1 would be equal to uh, two, 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 2 pi squared times r cubed over t squared times g. So one of those three formulas or somewhere in here is probably um, uh, useful to you. But like, really, you won't be ever asked a question where you can just steal these formulas uh, from, from the sheet that you just uh, hopefully took notes off of. Uh, what you'll really be asked to do is to show your work and show how you got there. So you need to know how to do this derivation. And we're going to practice it over and over and over again over the next few days. Um, so you guys can get really comfortable with it. And so you can also just get better at this kind of substitution. So that's the fun with orbits video. Uh, I hope that it helped you. I hope you didn't get totally lost in all the algebra there. Thank you. Bye.